Be looking good, warriors. All the way back to Kumpa. Great Lynn Thigpen was with me in that musical working. And we both got picked from that musical. And uh, she sat by me when we saw the rough cut. And I think she was shocked that it was just her mouth. The uh, notion of it really was in uh, the Shaber script. I just took the idea and made it a bigger idea. She became like a Greek chorus for the movie, always telling us where they were, how much farther they had to go. Lynn came in and read for the part. I just thought she had a great voice and uh, she had a great look. The super close-ups was something that happened just on the set. I kept saying, go closer, go closer. But later she said, to me that she didn't know we were making a classic because her lips are like nobody else's lips and Lynn Thigpen as the DJ is also one of the great memorable moments of that. With all the difficulties that I described to you about night photography in New York, the shooting of those scenes was even more difficult than the night photography. It was the last thing, and it was the nightmare where the waves would change, and there's terrible mismatches on the waves and the stuff behind, and the, we had the cameras broke down, and uh, it was a hard sequence. Uh, the whole very end thing where they all walk away, we were just racing against the setting sun. Walter explained to us that, you know, this, this is what I want you to do. You know, you just keep walking. Finally, you'll hear somebody or will let you guys know that the scene is cut. And, you know, we're walking and walking and walking. And, and you're, you're holding on to character, even though you know by now you are just a, a tiny little figure walking off. We had been walking for a very long time. And I remember whispering to Michael, I wanted to turn around because nobody had yelled, cut. I, am I deaf? I don't know what's happening. He's going, just keep walking. Finally, we walk right over a dune. We're like out of frame. It's like, okay, this is ridiculous. I mean, we walked halfway back to Manhattan. We decided they must be finished with us, and we had to go find the road, and we had to work our way back. And when we re-arrived, Walter and Frank were there with a dozen red roses. So that was just completely exemplary and amazing. We went on pure instinct and gut feelings on the movie. We just kept going forward trying to make the story work, trying to make it visually exciting. And I think it was that kind of adrenaline that we had going and the momentum that we had going and the rush to finish that helped add to the energy that the movie had. I thought that in the editing that we should be absolutely ruthless and make it move, 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 move that uh, this was meant to be an emotional experience and that we wanted it to be very dynamic. There really wasn't a lot to think about, so keep it moving, keep it moving. One of the reasons we had to have three cutting rooms going nonstop was that we were rushing to finish to beat the other gang movies that were coming out. Uh, the one that was really paralleling us was The Wanderers. They were shooting almost at the same time. It was based on a book like ours. It was a, a, a good story, totally different than our story. But, you know, you get put in the category of it's a gang movie. We wanted to be the first out, and we were. So we laid on the uh, full-scale editorial, and we were working six, seven days a week. We worked days. We worked nights. We, we didn't work around the clock, but we worked a lot of hours, seven days a week. From the time we finished shooting till we were in the dubbing stage, I can't remember how many weeks it was, but it wasn't very long. Goodbye. There was a scene at Coney Island that started the film where uh, they basically just discussed the conclave that was about to happen and said goodbye. And I told him that I thought it was a mistake from my point of view that this scene at the beginning of the film be a daytime scene. It just didn't seem to mesh. And he agreed. It just fell right out of the movie. It didn't seem to fit in. Once you started the movie at night and got into that, it all just came together. And uh, so I always say that you don't really cut things out so much as they fall out. I know a lot of you aren't too happy about going out on patrol. Just remember this. 
out of a street family of 120 plus affiliates, you were chosen for this expedition. The film has its own kind of truth. The film just shows you what's there and what isn't, what's worth and what isn't. He went back and shot the material that had the warriors talking to each other over shoulder shots with no context. And then intercutting some of the horseplay that had been filmed on their way up north with this limbo footage of them talking to each other and shots of the map, which had always been planned, a subway map. One of the things that we did in transitions editing-wise is we used a lot of wipes, a very old-fashioned technique that says, meanwhile, back at the wherever, the artificiality of the wipes was part of the notion that this isn't real life. Barry was working under terrific time pressure, and I kept emphasizing to him how much I wanted the music to reinforce the movement and to speed us along even more and he came in admirably on that. I was signed to do the score, and at that time, synthesizers were just being introduced, believe it or not. And I thought it was a nice overlay. Let's go with rock and roll, and let's add the synthesizers to give it just a little bit of eeriness and uh, just a different texture. Fucking A. Walter and I didn't feel we should put music in the baseball bat scene. We didn't want to take away from the reality. Larry Gordon, on the other hand, said there's a little too much reality there for me. And in fact, to put music in that scene, I had to borrow music from another place in the picture. But I think Larry was right. Without music, the scene is much more violent. With music, it in some way reminds the viewer that this is just a game. And I believe it's the first entire score that was written with a rock and roll synthesizer approach. It's rock and roll without lyrics, except for the end title, uh, In the City. Joe Walsh is a friend of mine, and we wrote that together. And happily for me, the Eagles recorded it after the fact. It was on the Long Run album and on the Hell Freezes Over album. So it's had a wonderful run for me. It was a little bit different from the score, but it was definitely rock and roll. Originally, there was narration to the movie, sort of setting the movie in its context. And we um, had Orson Welles to come do the narration. I had, uh, Frank and I had worked with Orson on this movie called The Other Side of, of the Wind. Ultimately, it fell apart, but I think it would have been an interesting thing if we would have had Orson's narration at the beginning of the movie and, and setting the movie in, in the context that Walter saw it. I was so frightened if nobody would come, it'd be a flop. I had no confidence in this movie to be a hit. I knew we had a good movie, but I just couldn't imagine people pouring out for this movie. I remember I was in New York and we had a big screening. It was tied to a radio station or something. Uh, and we had essentially a screen for teenagers. And I was at that, we blew the roof off the place. So I thought maybe, you know, maybe something was happening here. Um, I think there were six or seven movies that opened that weekend. I had heard that we were doing great business and the audiences were having a great time in the theaters and that it looked like we were off to be, uh, to be a big hit. The first response, the newspapers, was almost universally bad. And then the next wave, the kind of magazines and longer reviews and all that, were on the whole quite good. And boom, we were number one. And then the word of mouth started to spread and we sort of snowballed into this thing that was happening that, that had never really happened before. Then we had a couple of incidents that totally stopped everything. And suddenly, all I'm hearing is that if you go to this movie, The Warriors, somehow people will become agitated and they will begin rioting in the movie and you risk your life going to the movie. That was the word on the street. I think we were all kind of confused and didn't quite know what to make of it all. I think it's clear now because so many films have had the same kind of problem. What did happen was that certain gangs were attracted to the movie because of its subject matter and uh, they saw their traditional rivals across the way 
and uh, sometimes they got into it. The studio, I think the only thing you can say is they panicked. They pulled the marking first and, they, and it still kept going. And then they pulled the movie. I obviously I thought that was an unfortunate uh, turn of events and the movie kind of got labeled but I'm a great believer that you make the movies and you sign the movie and that's it. So I think you, you put it up there. If some people had a bad reaction to it, I'm sorry. It wasn't the intention. But the vast majority, I think, had a good reaction to it and they, they seem to continue to do so, so. Because it's not about gratuitous violence. It's, it, it's just about some, these nine guys trying to get home. You know, and they just have to defend themselves. And it's so stylish. I mean, what, you have a gang called a baseball furies where these guys got on baseball outfits and they got this, I mean, this psychedelic makeup on their face and they, they're fighting with baseball bats like they're fighting with ancient swords. And I mean, this movie is light years ahead of itself. Walter had a vision and he put together a, a movie uh, that Larry Gordon produced that has stood the test of time. 27 years ago, I had no idea that I'd be sitting here with a, a wonderful Frenchman named Laurent talking about the uh, cultural value of the warriors. That's a total surprise. <laughs> I didn't think I'd live this long. Out of all the films I've ever done, this has been my best experience working with a bunch of incredible young actors on the streets of New York, and we had a blast. And my mom, when she saw the movie, she said, you almost look tough in that movie. So I got close. <laughs> I've been employed in half the 32 movies I've been in because of The Warriors, really, including two other ones by Walter. Just because this was my first film, and because of the way everyone was with me, and because of where we shot it, and, and absolutely every ingredient that created this experience in my life, I think this will have to be my favorite movie. And it's timeless, so it, it just, it's never gone away. And I wanted to dedicate my few moments of recall to a very sweet friend and fan, Steve Duneau, who would have been so excited to receive a package like this that, that he could look at and listen to, but he unfortunately passed away. And I also wanted to dedicate it to our dear sweet Marcelino Sanchez. I hope they're having a conversation about it right now. Well, I think when you look back, there are a lot of movies today that are highly influenced by Walter's movies. Walter has a unique vision of the story he's trying to tell, and that's what I enjoyed about working with him, because we were trying to create this unique world. In the business, all the young screenwriters, all the young directors, everybody was just uh, always uh, their, one of their favorite films. As far as I was concerned, we had made a cartoon that people would not take seriously. I was way off base. People come up to you and say, are you the guy that did The Warriors? And say, well, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and then they say how much they liked it. And uh, so over the years, I just got this enormous amount of uh, people writing me and uh, coming up to me in the streets and all that kind of thing. And uh, so I was aware that it had this other life. And also people kept showing it. They kept having special screenings and all that kind of thing. See, one of the things I think that the film has uh, this other life is there's a humorous aspect to the movie. You know, from the very beginning, the fun the audience had and the way they laughed at the jokes. Uh, there's a lot of humor that is put in there along with the Jeopardy, and the humor always played, and I think it still plays. Um, and uh, I think that's that accounts for a lot of the popularity of the movie. Yeah, that's right, warriors. Just keep walking. Real tough mothers, ain't you?